Six Mexican states will go to the polls on Sunday to elect their new governors. The United States authorities reported a new mass shooting in a city in the state of Tennessee. Sunday, June 5th marks World Environmental Day, a date that seeks to raise awareness about the importance of caring for ecosystems and fostering respect towards Mother Earth. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Diego Martin. From the Telstar Studios in Havana, we begin with the news. In Mexico, the National Electoral Institute reported that 91.1% of the polling stations were installed to elect new governors. The highest percentage is in Aguascalientes and Tamaulipas with 100%, followed by Hidalgo with 99.70, Durango 99.02, Quintana Roo with 98.08, and Oaxaca 97.76%. The executive secretary of the office at Mundo Jacobo said that there are some incidents reported attended by federal and state authorities. Jacobo reiterated that in addition to the trends of the election results issued by quick counts and the capture of voting records in the preliminary electoral results program, the official results will be announced next Wednesday after the district counts are carried out. In a radio interview, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro highlighted the response of the governments of the continent to the exclusion policy of the United States in the convening of the Summit of the Americas. It is a clear contradiction of the meetings in Los Angeles where the intention is to hold a Summit of the Americas. It is clear that this is not a summit and even less a summit of the Americas. It is a meeting where important and respectable representatives of our Americas will attend. But simply the government of the United States took it upon itself to drive a dagger into the back of success of the summit of the Americas. More than 25 governments of the continent have expressed their public protest and their demand that all the governments of the continent be invited to the summit of the Americas. 25 out of 33. Almost 90% of the governments of the continent had the courage in different ways to express their protest. The president said progress has been made in the dialogue with the United States in order to make oil production more flexible. The first steps are being taken. The U.S. a week or so ago took some slight but significant steps by granting licenses to the U.S. company Chevron, the Italian company ENI, and Rexall to begin the processes that will lead them to produce oil and gas in Venezuela for export to their natural markets. According to Reuters news agency, the United States government authorized Italy's ENI and Spain's Repsol to start shipping Venezuelan oil to Europe in order to compensate, in Washington's opinion, the European dependence on Russian oil. The agreement includes the condition that the product will not be resold from Europe to other regions. The decision is not expected to have any impact on international oil prices. In Colombia, a recent poll showed that Gustavo Petro, the candidate for the historical pact, leads the voting intention over the presidential election set for June 19th. According to a poll made by the National Consulting Center, Petro leads the preference with 44.9 percent out of the candidate for the League of Anti-Corruption Rulers, Rodolfo Hernández, who would accumulate 41 percent of the voter intention. The study showed that Hernández leads the preference in Antioquia, the coffee-growing region, and the central eastern region with margins of 10 points over Petro. While Petro leads in the capital city of Bogotá, the Caribbean region, and the Pacific, with differences of at least 30 points over Hernández. The United States authorities reported a new mass shooting on Sunday in a city in the state of Tennessee. The shooting took place in the city of Chattanooga, where at least three people were killed and more than a dozen were injured. This incident occurred just two hours after another mass shooting in Philadelphia that left at least three people dead and 11 wounded. Authorities said that at least one minor was among the wounded and that several victims remained in critical condition. The authorities noted that there was more than one shooter involved in the incident. 
The U.S. has been suffering from a wave of gun violence and mass shootings for several weeks, including tragedies at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, and a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, which left dozens dead. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. And welcome back to From the South. In Cuba, damage assessment and recovery efforts continue after the heavy rains that hit mainly its westernmost provinces. President Miguel Diaz Canel highlighted the actions being carried out in Havana's neighborhoods to face the floods. Our correspondent Fabiola Lopez is with the details. Panorama of the Fanguito neighborhood after the heavy rains that flooded several areas of Havana on Friday. Here, party authorities give guidelines to assess damages and begin recovery work. We are helping the neighbors to clean the houses that were floated by the river. And we are also cleaning the central line that runs directly into the river. Guillermina Alberja is one of the neighbors of the Fanguido, this neighborhood in transformation, which suffered the most damage when the breakdown of a pedestrian bridge on the Almendares in a few minutes caused severe floating in several houses along the river. Guillermina explains that her neighbors also suffered material damage. Aleida shows Telesur the damage to her house. What was not expected was that during the evacuation, which was being carried out, the river would come with such intensity. Immediately, all the authorities of the People's Council came, as well as the government and the province, concerned to see the conditions in which we were, especially in terms of health, food, and water, were guaranteed. A water pipe was brought in so that we would not be affected by the river water that had entered at that moment. Therefore, the action of the government management was there. One hundred eleven landslides in Havana, two total and one hundred nine partial, and ninety one affected electrical circuits were some of the damages caused by the heavy rains that left in the Cuban capital. Five hundred ninety five evacuees in twenty three centers and more than three thousand self evacuees in homes of neighbors and relatives. At the moment, in the 50 municipalities of the province, there are brigades of the construction, transport of cargo and transportation, supporting the cleanup of solid waste, planning residues, rubble. There are also brigades of support of, to the construction, for once the climatological situation allows, as everything seems to indicate that it's going to do. So also to enter the evaluation of the damage, especially of the collapses, and to begin in the restoration of the affected houses and buildings. Experts from the Meteorological Institute warn that it may still rain in the west of the country in the afternoon and evening hours, but they say most of the rainfall from Saturday onwards will move to the center of the country. Fabiola López, Telesur, La Habana. In the Philippines, the eruption of a volcano caused the evacuation of neighboring towns due to ashes and possible new eruptions. According to the Institute of Volcanology and Seismology of Philippines, the eruption of the Bulusan volcano in the province of Sorsogon lasted about 17 minutes and the column of smoke rose at least one kilometer high. Authorities reported that level one of danger has been established around the crater of the volcano and created an exclusion zone with a four kilometer range. Authorities advised locals likewise to stock up on food and drinking water. Meanwhile, ashes have already begun to reach nearby villages and volcanic earthquakes have been felt, although no lava has been detected so far. The Philippines is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire, an area of significant seismology and has some 20 active volcanoes. And the people of India have witnessed a burning summer heat with temperatures exceeding 47 degrees Celsius all over the country. 
Indian Meteorological Department issued on Sunday a yellow alert warning of a heat anomaly in isolated areas of the country. They stated that Saturday the maximum temperature was 47.1 degrees Celsius. It was recorded in the region of Mungishpur, while the city of Pitampura recorded 46.5 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the Najafgarh Meteorological Station recorded 46.2 degrees Celsius. Likewise, the meteorological authorities in New Delhi detailed that the heat wave is likely to increase by 2 degrees in several areas of northwest and central India during the next 2 to 3 days. Russian President Vladimir Putin warned that a new United States military aid package to Ukraine would not help bring about positive changes in the conflict. In statements to the press, the Russian president denounced that the additional deliveries of weapons to Kiev have only one goal, to extend the conflict on the Ukrainian territory. In view of this fact, he warned that in the event that Ukraine receives long-range missiles from the U.S., Moscow will take the appropriate conclusions and will use its means of destruction to hit the facilities that they have avoided to attack up so far. Putin's statements come in response to statements made by his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden, who officially announced Tuesday the delivery of a new military aid package to Ukraine, which would include HIMARS multiple rocket launchers, a type of long-range weapon that Kiev has been requesting for months from its Western allies in the midst of the Russian military operation in the neighboring territory initiated on February 24th. If they supply the long-range missiles to Ukraine, we will draw the appropriate conclusions and use our weapons, of which we have enough, to strike targets we haven't yet hit. All this kerfuffle around additional arms deliveries serves only one goal, to prolong the armed conflict as long as possible. In France, authorities confirmed that negotiations are underway with the United Arab Emirates to replace oil imports from Russia. The information was confirmed by France's economy minister Bruno Le Maire, who also reported that these negotiations are being carried out as part of the Western embargo against the Eurasian nation. The head of the economy portfolio also declared that his country must find an energy alternative to Russian oil as part of a policy of independence regarding President Vladimir Putin's resources. The European Union agreed last May 30th a progressive embargo on Russian oil transported by ship to the Union with the intention of avoiding the veto of Hungary, which receives it directly by pipeline. On Sunday, China launched a rocket carrying three astronauts on a mission to complete construction of its new space station. The trio blasted off in a Long March 2F rocket from the Jishuan Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert, said state broadcaster CCTV, with a team to spend six months expanding the Tiangong space station. It is expected to become fully operational by the end of the year. China's space program has already seen the nation land a rover on Mars and sent probes to the moon. Tiangong's core module entered orbit earlier last year and is expected to operate for at least a decade. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. On Sunday, June 5th, the uh, World Environment Day, a date that seeks to raise awareness about the importance of caring for ecosystems and fostering respect towards Mother Earth. The date was proclaimed by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1972, coinciding with the beginning of the Stockholm Conference, whose main theme was precisely the environment. The commemoration calls upon the world's population to focus efforts on motivating individuals and communities to become active agents of sustainable development and protection of the planet. This date is taken as an opportunity to invite people to improve their consumption habits, companies to develop more ecological models, governments to protect wilderness areas, and teachers to educate in natural values, as well as young people to raise their voices for the future of the planet, and to remember that an environmental protection requires the support of everyone.
Namayadeen reported that Israeli settlers stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque under heavy security measures by the occupation forces. It was also reported that they closed the doors of the mosque to worshippers inside it with chains to secure the settlers' incursions. In addition, they fired rubber bullets at the youths, causing them injuries. Al-Aqsa Mosque Director Omar Al-Kizwani said that so far five groups of extremist settlers have broken into the Al-Aqsa courtyards and are performing provocative prayers. Israeli forces deployed inside the courtyards to secure the settlers' entry and laid siege to the Al-Kibli Hall, where dozens of worshippers are present to prevent friction. The break-ins follow a call by temple organizations to storm the Al-Aqsa Mosque and its courtyards in memory of the Jew Jewish celebration of the so-called holiday of Shavuot. The Batwa, the name by which the so-called pygmies are known as Rwanda and Burundi, have made significant progress in recent years, but they remain a vulnerable population as they are exposed to multiple precariousness due to the lack of resources, services, and opportunities. From Burundi, Oscar Apelde reports. Arrived on her own amid strong constructions and immediately gave birth to a baby, her second daughter. I brought health care to local women. If this new health center did not exist, she would have had to walk several kilometers as she did for her first pregnancy. Children and their mothers receive free service. Also, she wouldn't have had the money to pay for the service. She told us that she has very few properties, works as a day laborer on other people's land, and is paid less than a half a dollar a day. Weights 2,600 kilograms. The health center has electricity thanks to an NGO that has installed solar panels on the roof. The electricity network does not reach the hill, and the center was on the verge of ruin because of the price of diesel. This entire mother and child center is really the fruit of solidarity. Six nurses attend to three or sometimes five births per day, in addition to about 20 outpatients. The most common diseases, paludism and other parasites, do not get children when the health service is guaranteed and when the medicines prescribed are dispensed free of charge to those who cannot afford them. The promoter of the center is a priest, a native of this hill, where he grew up using banana leaf as notebooks. He is currently the rector of the University of Gozi after living in Spain for 20 years. He is still experiencing great difficulties in sustaining the management of the center, but is amazed at the strength of solidarity. When something good is done, there are always forces life of love that are there to support, to sustain. That's great. Daraiji, the baby's father, is 24 years old and smiles brightly as he looks at his second daughter. He has decided to name her Dajiketsa, Adoration. Like most Vatwa, Daraiji works as a day laborer on other people's crops because he has no land of his own. Since he has to buy food for his mother and family, he is unable to save money to lease the so-called communal land. After two nights of observation at the center since Dajiquesa's birth, Dancile, his mother, and her 20-year-old sister, who has come to help her, are returning home. The center is located in the Badva neighborhood, a little apart from the others. The women of the clan told us that the Badwa who had lands were stolen from them because they were a marginalized community with no rights. They also told us that the things are better now because the children go to school and the women have access to health care. According to baby Dajikesa's grandmother, before, if they touched a container at the health center, for example, no one would touch it again. However, she says, the situation improved and now they feel like everyone else. But they need support because they don't have a social security card, for example. Dajikesa's mother shows us her house, a simple house made of sugarcane and adobe that was built a year ago, but they still have not been able to cover the entire roof. We asked her about her dreams. She has many. 
She says she wants to evolve, but does not know how she will be able to do it. The Batwa are true craftsmen with ceramics and demonstrate their skill and intelligence even though they have never been able to go to school until now because they had to pay for it. In fact, the community's teenagers are the first Batwa to have been enrolled in schools in this hill since the introduction of free education. What does the future hold for the Yikesa? Time will tell. Perhaps the future holds a plus of solidarity, hopefully. Desde la colina de Endaba, Oscar Repelde para Telesur. We have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telesur English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.